Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, we are going to talk about chapter two, the chemical context of life today from Campbell's biology in focus. Um, we are actually going to skip the beginning of this chapter because it talks about basic chemistry, it talks about atoms, talks about elements, what protons, neutrons, electrons are, what a valence electron is. It talks about all these basic chemistry ideas because this is a more advanced biology course. You should have already taken chemistry and you should know these things. It's nothing super complicated. So the notes are still here. So if you don't know them, absolutely go through it. Um, if it's something that you are not familiar with or you just want to kind of refresh your memory, yes, please go through all of that. Okay, but I'm going to skip to slide 52, um, which will start talking about water, which is the main focus of this chapter. Okay, so just to show you, it talks about matter, elements and compounds, Here's examples of elements and compounds, talks about trace elements and essential elements, talks about the atom and the construction of it, um, talks about how to read, basically read the periodic table um, and all of the different shells of your um, atoms, talks about chemical bonds, which we're going to focus on. There's covalent, ionic, and hydrogen bonding that we're going to talk about. So that is all here. This is water. You're going to talk about this today. Um, all of that is in here for those of you that don't remember all of this information. Like I said, I'm expecting you to know this already because you talked about this in a general chemistry class. So I will be starting here. So it's the end of the chemistry overview. But again, the information is there in the student slides that y'all have for my class. Um, if you would like to review those, please do. Um, am I going to ask about those things specifically? No, I'm going to focus more on the uh, pH and waters topics that we're about to get into. But you need to know some basic chemistry in order to answer the questions. So am I going to ask you, what's an electron? No, I'm not. But do you need to know what an electron is to answer some of the other questions? Yes, absolutely. So that's there for your study purposes should you decide to study that. Okay, so we're going to be talking about water. So hydrogen bonding gives water properties that help make life on Earth possible. If you hadn't realized, most of Earth is covered in water, and most organisms on Earth are largely composed of water. So it's obviously extremely important for this whole process of the study of life called, you know, biology, the class you're taking, okay? So all organisms are made mostly of water and live on an environment dominated by water. So obviously, water is going to be pretty important. We got to get some of that H2O, okay? So water molecules are polar, means that they have a slightly negative side and a slightly positive side. And that's what those little fancy S is. It's, um, Consider like a dipole that it has a slightly negative side and a slightly positive side, which is polar. It's got two poles, okay? Uh, two water molecules are held together by hydrogen bonds. That's going to be very important because look at the topic. Hydrogen bonding gives water properties that make life possible. So hydrogen bonds are going to be really important if water is really important, and that's how water is held together. So pretty much when in doubt, hydrogen bonds. If you don't understand why something is happening and we're talking about water, just throw in hydrogen bonds and you're probably going to be right. So here you can see some of these hydrogen bonds in action. They're holding together these water molecules, right? They kind of look like little Mickey Mouses. Um, the hydrogen bonds are represented by dotted lines because they are extremely weak bonds, right? So they can uh, be made and broken several times a second, actually very, very rapidly. And then you'll also see um, the little fancy S's, like a slightly negative region and a slightly positive region on our water molecules there. So you can see that the hydrogen side is slightly positive and the um, oxygen side is slightly negative. Right. And so obviously those opposites are going to attract and that's what helps us form our hydrogen bonding right there. Um, and then you'll see that polar covalent bonds are much more rigid bonds that are going to hold our H2O, our water molecule itself together. OK, so there are four emergent properties of water that contribute to Earth's sustainability for life. OK, so four main things we're going to talk about. So Co cohesive behavior, which is also going to hint at adhesive behavior. Okay, the ability to moderate temperature, expansion upon freezing, which we all know because we drink fluid that has ice in it, and then the versatility as a solvent, also very important. So these are the four characteristics of water that's um, allowing it to have earth covered in water be um, a great place for us to live. Also, our bodies full of water being as functional and awesome as they are. It's the cool characteristics of water that allow life to happen. Pretty important. Okay, so cohesion, co, 
means together. So cohesion of water molecules means what? Putting water molecules together, okay? So water molecules are linked by multiple hydrogen bonds. We just looked at a picture of this. Um, the molecules stay close together because of this and it's called cohesion. So this is just like that picture we just looked at. It's how water sticks to itself. Co means together. So cohesion of water molecules is just a bunch of little water droplets sticking together. You'll notice that like if it rains on your windshield or something, you see a bunch of little tiny water droplets. And then when they make a bigger water droplet, then it falls, right? When they all come together like that, that's an example of cohesion. Okay, so cohesion due to hydrogen bonding contributes to the transportation, the transport of water and nutrients against gravity in plants. So cohesion is water being able to stick to itself. So, right, cohesion due to hydrogen bonding. So how is cohesion possible? Hydrogen bonds, right? Like I said, that's the key. So hydrogen bonds allow cohesion of water molecules, okay? And that contributes to the transport of water and nutrients against gravity in plants because where are roots? Roots are down in the ground. Okay, that's where water is going to get absorbed into a plant. Where does that water need to go? Well, it needs to go to the rest of the plant. Let's talk about a tree. Trees are large. They're tall, right? The roots are very low. Their limbs are very high. So how are we going to get water against gravity here? It's cohesion due to hydrogen bonding that allows water to stick to itself and kind of get like sucked up right? There's also a little bit of adhesion there. This is also called capillary action, which we'll talk about when we get more into plants, right? But there's cohesion working here. There's adhesion, which is water sticking to other surfaces, okay? And then you have capillary action, which is a combination of cohesion and adhesion, allowing things to travel up a small surface area like a, um, like a straw, right? but it's happening on its own. And we'll actually use capillary tubes in our lab over all of this to show you what that would look like as we have the transport of water and nutrients in our plants. Um, so adhesion is the clinging of one substance to another. This also plays a role, like I just said. So adhesion, think about adhesive. What is that? It's glue, right? Or like an adhesive bandaid, it's sticky, it sticks to you, right? So this is the ability of water to stick to other surfaces as well. Okay, so cohesion is water sticking to itself, and adhesion is when we have water sticking to other surfaces. Okay, so this is kind of all we just talked about. We talked about how there's a tree, and we have our roots down low, which is where water is going to be absorbed, and then our trees are very tall, so we have limbs and leaves and everything up at the top that needs to get that water, so we're going against gravity here. So these are two different uh, types of water conducting cells that we're going to have the water and nutrients traveling up. And there's an example of both cohesion and adhesion. So again, these little dotted lines are hydrogen bonds showing you that water can stick to itself, but water can also stick to other surfaces, which is obviously gonna be these like little straw-like structures that are in plants, which we'll learn about later. I don't wanna overload you right now. Okay, so surface tension um, is a measure of how hard it is to break the surface of a liquid. If you've ever seen any of like the still shots of like the like Olympic swimmers or whatever, as they're like doing like the, what is it? The backstroke, where little faces are coming up out of the water and they're still kind of like, looks like they're about to be like birthed. They're like still halfway in the water. It's really cool. Water has very high surface tension. Um, so surface tension is a, is a result of or related to cohesion. So again, that's water sticking to itself due to hydrogen bonds. So surface tension, I think, yep, this is a horrifying picture, but it's a spider on water. And you can see that it's like standing on water, which again, horrifying. But it's possible. You might have also seen like on like lakes, like those little like skater bug things that kind of go around. They look like mosquito hawks. I don't really know what they are. I don't spend a lot of time at lakes. But they do have the same sort of thing where if their mass is kind of spread out, then they can uh, not break the surface tension. They can actually use it to, as an advantage to kind of like sit on top of the water. Okay, um, the next thing we're going to talk about is moderation of temperature by water. So if you notice that like coastal regions kind of don't have like these huge fluxes, like I'm giving this lecture from Texas. Now Texas likes to do its own thing, right? It was once its own country. Texas, you could wake up in the morning at 60 degrees and by lunchtime it's 111 because Texas is crazy, right? But near coastal regions where there's a lot of, you know, water because it's on the coast, they have more of a like resistant to these huge swings in temperature. It's pretty much like a constant temperature all the time. So water absorbs heat from warm air and releases stored heat 
to cooler air. So this means that if it's really, really, really hot, the stored heat is going to be released into the air, which means it's going to make it warmer. If it's really, really, really cold, the heat that's stored in the water is going to be released into the air, okay? So water is helping to resist these big changes in temperature. Uh, water can absorb or release a large amount of heat with only a slight change in its own temperature. So water, it's very, very hard to change the temperature of water. It requires a lot of energy, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So water is extremely resistant to changing temperatures. It takes a large amount of energy to change the temperature of water, okay? Uh, so that's why, like I said, water absorbs heat from warm air and releases that stored heat into cooler air. It's helping to kind of balance out the temperature between it and the air around it. Temperature and heat. So let's talk about this a little bit further. So kinetic energy is energy of motion. You know, kinetic is moving around. Okay, thermal energy is obviously referring to heat. So it's a measure of the total amount of kinetic energy due to molecular motion. You know that as you increase temperature, that molecules start to move around faster, right? And as you cool down a temperature, you decrease in temperature, your molecules move slower. Okay, so kinetic energy and thermal energy are definitely related to each other. Um, we have the temperature that represents the average kinetic energy of molecules. That makes sense. It's very, very hot. Our molecules are moving very, very fast. If it's very, very cold, our molecules are moving very, very slow. Okay, so thermal energy um, in transfer from one body of matter to another is defined as heat. Okay, so you'll see that we have a huge transfer of heat between um, between water and, other, and its environment. Okay, um, Celsius is typically the degree that we use for science because Fahrenheit is like something specific to like mostly America because they're special. So the Celsius scale, a scale is a, a measurement of temperature using degrees Celsius. And there's a reason that degrees Celsius is better than degrees Fahrenheit. So as a calorie, now you're used to being like, oh, 100 calorie pack of the Special K cereal snack bar or something, right? You're used to seeing like, chip bags, cookies, things like 100 calorie snack pack, things like that. So a calorie is actually the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram or one milliliter, same thing, of water by one degree Celsius. So a calorie is a measurement of heat. It's a measurement of energy, okay? So it's a measurement of this heat that's going to raise one gram or one milliliter of water by one degree Celsius. That's the definition of a calorie. You're gonna need that later, so make sure that you memorize that. Okay, if we're dealing with calories on our food packages, those are technically in kilocalories, they're called food calories, where it's actually gonna be 1,000 calories, okay, is equal to um, one kilocalorie, which is like if you're eating a 100 snack pack, that's actually the measurement here, this is the conversion. So it's actually like a 1,000 of like our regular little calories. So food calories are measured in like K calories, K cows, kilocals. Okay, but those are called food calories. So it's still, a, um, it's an amount of heat still, even for your body, okay? Um, and then we have the joule, which is a, um, it's a unit of energy. These are, calories are units of energy and heat. Okay, but the joule is specifically a unit of energy where one joule is equal to these conversions here. Okay, you'll need some of this for the lab that we're doing. Um, if your instructors are also doing labs over this, I recommend memorizing these or writing these down in a little cheat sheet for quick um, calculations later. Okay, so water is high specific heat. So we're just talking about the amount of heat to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So now we're gonna talk about water's heat. Okay, high specific heat. So the specific heat of a substance is the amount of heat that must be absorbed or lost for one gram of that substance to change its temperature by one degree Celsius. And luckily for us, we're talking about water. So the specific heat of water is one calorie per gram per degree Celsius. So we're saying that basically one calorie is the specific heat for water here. That remember one calorie can raise the temperature one degree Celsius, one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Okay, that's the specific heat of water, which means that water resists changing its temperature because it has a very high specific heat. 
Okay, there are other liquids that can fluctuate a lot faster because they need a lot less energy input or a lot less heat input or loss to them um, to change their temperature. But water has a very high specific heat. Like I said, it resists changes in temperature because it has a very high specific heat as defined out here and by our calorie. So water's high specific heat can be traced to hydrogen bonding. Again, what's the golden rule here? If we're talking about what makes water special, it's going to be a hydrogen bond. Pretty, pretty sure. Pretty sure about that one. Okay. So heat is absorbed when hydrogen bonds break and heat is released when hydrogen bonds form. And I told you that hydrogen bonds can form several times a second. It's very, very quick. That's why they're represented by those dotted lines because they're very weak. It's not a rigid covalent bond like you'd see in the rest of it, like our water molecule itself between our H2 and O, right? This is between the water molecules. And these bonds are rapidly, you know, water's a liquid most of the time or gas most of the time, okay? And it's constantly, rude Siri, um, it's constantly in, in motion right? So these bonds are being broken and remade all over the place. So that's what's heat is absorbed or heat is released based on these different interactions between the molecules. So the high specific heat of water keeps temperature fluctuations within limits that permit life, right? So because water has a very high specific heat and it resists change in temperature, and because these hydrogen bonds are constantly being made and broken, we're both absorbing and releasing heat to kind of balance out, right? If you're constantly absorbing and releasing, you're going to be about the same all the time, kind of even keel, right? So that's how life is able to survive on our planet, which is mostly water. Okay, so there's also called something something called evaporative cooling, which we're going to talk about, and we as humans do this all the time. So evaporation is a transformation of a substance from liquid to gas, okay? Heat of vaporization is a heat um, a liquid must absorb for one gram or one milliliter to be converted into gas. So as a liquid evaporates, its remaining surface cools, a process called evaporative cooling. So when you're outside, like right now, summertime in Texas, heat index yesterday was 112. You're outside for five minutes and you're sweating, okay? You're sweating. You have water. We're talking about water. You have water called sweat water on the surface of your skin. Guess what happens? It evaporates. Then what phenomenon happens? Evaporative cooling, which means that the temperature of the surface is going to cool as the water evaporates because of heat of vaporization. Okay, so evaporative cooling of water helps to stabilize temperatures in organisms and bodies of water. So definitely for us, that helps us to maintain homeostasis by sweating and then evaporative cooling is going to cool the surface of our skin a little bit. Okay, so floating of ice on liquid water. We've all experienced this because we've all had a glass of water that has ice in it and it floats, it does not sink. Okay, so ice floats, ice in case you were unfamiliar, was solid water, okay? So ice or solid water uh, floats in liquid water because hydrogen bonds in ice are more ordered, more structured, making the light, <laughs> the ice less dense, okay? And we'll look at a picture of that. It's a very rigid structure. When ice is created, water is cooled, 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 cooled until it's no longer water, it's ice. And it expands, right? If you put a bottle of water in the freezer, you know that it, the bottom of it typically pops out. Or maybe if it was filled too much, the cap like busts or something, right? That's why you can't put a can of soda in the freezer because it'll explode. Your mom will get mad at you, okay? Because water expands as it freezes. And that's because... Of hydrogen bonds, okay? So water reaches its greatest density at four degrees Celsius. Um, if ice were to sink, think about the implication of life. You know, you can go like ice skating in places that have actual seasons and not Texas over the tops of lakes and ponds and things like that because the ice is where? The ice is at the top. Is the ice at the bottom? No. That would be awful for life on Earth, right? Ice is at the top because it is less dense than water. It floats on water. If ice sank, then all the bodies of water would eventually freeze solid. Okay, think about the ocean freezing completely solid. Now that would be a very, very cold environment for a very, very long amount of time in order for that to happen. But if it did, and all the ice were to sink, then it would be frozen forever. The amount of heat that it would take to thaw all of that out, all of that deep ice, we'd all be dead. 
Well, we'd all be dead because of the ice anyway. But you see how important water is? Just think about that, right? If all the ice sank in a pond, we'll talk about something much smaller, right? What's going to happen to the life? All the fish are going to die. The plants are going to die. The snails, the bacteria, everything's going to die, right? But if we have ice that floats, it kind of acts as an insulator because it's keeping the cold air out of the water. It's not making contact with it anymore. So it's actually allowing life on earth in these aquatic environments to continue. And then you see like things like ice fishing, right? The fish are still alive in there. They're not just like frozen solid waiting for summer to come. No, right? They are still living the little fish life underneath that blanket of ice because ice is less dense than water and it floats. So here's a picture of that. So this is what we say when ice is more ordered, right? There's a very rigid, like little hexagon structure that's happening here. Whereas liquid water, all these little molecules are constantly bumping into each other. In a solid, it's held still. And notice these little air pockets, right? Between just based on the hydrogen bonding between our oxygen of one uh, molecule of water and the hydrogen of the other, you see that there's a rigid hexagonal structure. And what's in the middle of each of these little rings? Air, right? There's air there. So that's why ice takes up more room because there's air pockets. And that's why it floats when you put it in water because there's air inside of it. Even though you can't see it, it's on a molecular scale. Pretty cool. Okay. So water is also the solvent of life. It's considered the universal solvent. So you know in a solution, you have a solvent and a solute, okay? The solvent is the dissolving agent. The solute is what gets dissolved. So I think about like solute, get dissolved, solute, okay? Solvent, water is the universal solvent. It dissolves a lot of things, okay? So in a solution, it's a liquid that has a homogeneous mixture of substances. The solvent is the thing that does the dissolving and the solute is a substance that is dissolved, okay? So in salt water, the solvent would be water because water is the universal solvent. And the solute is salt because salts, you get dissolved, okay? Um, in aqueous solution, um, we have one, which is water. Water is the solvent. Okay. So aqueous just means that it is a water containing solution. Okay. Uh, water is a versatile, uh, solvent due to its polarity. Uh, water is polar because remember we talked about the slightly negative and slightly positive regions of our water molecules. It's considered a polar molecule because it has the oxygen side, which is slightly negative and the hydrogen side, which is slightly positive. Um, this allows it to form hydrogen bonds very easily. And there's also a saying when we're talking about solutions that like dissolves like. So something polar will dissolve in something that is polar. Something that is nonpolar will dissolve in something that is nonpolar. Okay. So that's something that is just universal for chemistry. Like dissolves like. There's a bunch of little memes about a polar bear and a black bear that fall off into like a, a lake or something. And the polar bear is like, ooh, ooh, I'm dissolving. And the black bear is looking at them like, what the heck? Because it's a polar bear. It's a polar and water is polar and like dissolves like. Okay. This is why I'm old. It's okay. It's fine. It's funny. Look it up. Okay. Um, so when an ionic compound is dissolved in water, um, each ion is surrounded in a sphere of water molecules called a hydration shell. So we'll look at that. This is NaCl is salt, like table salt that you'd put on your French fries. When you put it into water, you can see that this ionic substance has kind of become encapsulated by water molecules, which again is called the hydration shell. Okay, water can also dissolve compounds made of non-ionic polar molecules. Again, polar because water is polar and like dissolves like. So even large polar molecules such as proteins can dissolve in water if they have ionic and polar regions because like dissolves like. Polar things dissolve polar things. Water is polar. It can dissolve other things that are also polar. Great. Here's another example of that. Even though this is a very, very large molecule and those hydration shells will take a long time to establish, it will still happen. Okay, next we're gonna talk about hydrophilic and hydrophobic substances. So a hydrophilic substance is a substance that has an affinity for water. So it literally means water loving. Hydrophobic is a substance that does not have an affinity for water. It means water fearing, it's going to repel water. 
Okay, so um, oil molecules are hydrophobic because they are relatively non-polar because they have a bunch of hydrocarbon chains. C and H, those are not polar. Neither one of those is charged. Okay, a colloid is a stable suspension of fine particles in a liquid. We're not really worried about that. I'm worried about the definition of hydrophilic and hydrophobic, right? Hydrophilic is something that likes water. It can touch water and it's cool with water. It can usually dissolve in water. Hydrophobic things, think about sticking a whole stick of butter into a cup of water. That's a lipid, it's a fat, it's butter, and then you put it into a cup of water. Well, it's nonpolar, it's considered an oil, a fat, okay? It's not going to dissolve, it is hydrophobic, it's water fearing, so nothing's gonna happen if you put one of these hydrophobic, and also when you were a little kid, you probably made, quote, lava lamps by putting like food coloring and oil and water together and shaking it up. Eventually, it's gonna separate back out, right? So that's hydrophobic and hydrophilic. We'll talk about these terms a lot during the year, so make sure that you get them straight. Okay, um, solute concentration in aqueous solution. So most biochemical reactions occur in water. Think about that. In your body, you have all these reactions that are happening all the time. And your body is like between 60 to 80% water, right? At any given time, it can fluctuate, okay? So there's all these reactions happening in the body that are mostly happening in water because most of you is water. Um, chemical reactions depend on um, collisions of molecules and therefore on the concentration of the solutes in an aqueous solution. Obviously, if you have salt water that you barely put any little tiny pinch of salt into it, you're not gonna have a lot of collisions. It's not gonna be a very salty substance and it's going to, um, since there's so much water, it's going to dissociate very quickly into sodium and Chlor um, chloride, right? So for sodium chloride, table salt. Um, whereas if you put a whole bunch into it, then you're gonna have more interactions with the sodium chloride itself and less water. Okay, so uh, molecular mass is the sum of uh, all masses of all atoms in a molecule. Again, this is more chemistry stuff. I'm not gonna actually go through in my physical class how to like, calculate molarity and things, but these are just some definitions to keep in your back pocket. Um, numbers of molecules, are usually measured in Avogadro's number, the mole, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules are equal to one mole. That's a standard definition there. Um, Avogadro's number um, and the unit Dalton were defined such that 6.02 times 10 to the 23 Daltons is equal to one gram. Okay, molarity is the number of moles of solute per liter of solution. So sometimes when you're doing an experiment, you might see that, oh, we're gonna use a two molar solution which means it has two moles of solute per liter of solution, okay? Um, like I said, for my purposes, you will not be calculating that, but if you see that there's different concentrations, it's based on molarity. The higher the number, the more solute in there. That's how you read them. Um, next, we're gonna talk about acids and bases, which is getting into the pH scale. So sometimes a hydrogen ion, H+, is transferred from one water molecule to another leaving behind a hydroxide ion, which is OH minus, okay? So basically you have two H2Os, you have one hydrogen that breaks off, so you have like an H3O plus and an OH minus. Okay, so the proton binds to the other water molecule forming a hydronium ion. That's what I just said here, right? So you can see that if we had two H2Os and we gave one H here, then you'd only have an O and an H left over, and this would be minus because of that oxygen, and here you have an extra proton, so it's positive. Okay, so by convention, H plus is used to represent the hydronium ion. So this is what we're just talking about. Two water molecules can break up into hydronium and hydroxide, one with a positive and one with a negative charge. So these little hydrogens can kind of get passed back and forth to create these two molecules. So um, though water dissociation is rare and reversible, it's important in the chemistry of life. So H and OH are very reactive. Um, sol um, solutes called acids and bases disrupt the balance between H and OH in pure water because pure water is our baseline for the pH scale. It's neutral, meaning that we have H2O. It's an equal amount of our OH and our H. Acids increase the hydronium or the hydrogen concentration of water, while bases reduce the concentration of, OH be or of H plus because they're going to add OH to the water. So an acid is any substance that increases the hydrogen concentration of a solution or hydronium, okay? Um, a base is any substance that reduces 
the hydrogen or hydronium concentration of a solution because it's actually adding in OH. Okay, so a strong acid like um, hydrochloric acid, HCl, dissociates completely into H plus and Cl minus in water. So when you add um, hydrochloric acid into water, this is how it dissociates. And it's adding H plus, which means that it is an acid because it's increasing the hydrogen or hydronium. Okay, sodium hydroxide, NaOH, when you put that into water, it dissociates, NaOH, Na and OH. If you have a lot of OH, you're a base. Okay, those are the definitions. An acid has a lot of hydrogen, a base has low hydrogen, which means high um, hydroxide. These are some more examples of just how we have extra H's here. Okay, we're not talking about the math for my class, but the math is defined here for you. Okay, it's going to be a logarithmic scale. So pH of a solution is defined by the negative logarithm of the hydronium or um, hydrogen concentration, which is written as the pH is equal to the negative log of the concentration of hydrogen. Okay, so acidic solutions have a pH less than 7. Acidic, high um, hydrogen low pH value. So 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 are all acids because they have a lot of hydrogen. Okay, basic solutions are anything greater than 7. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, it's, it's 0 through 14 or 1 through 14 based on your textbook. Okay, so basic solutions are anything higher than 7 because they have a very low amount of hydrogen, right, or the hydronium. Um, so it's kind of inversely related there. Okay, so water should be neutral at seven, which means it is not acidic, it is not basic, it is neutral, it is exactly in the middle, one to 14, the middle is around seven, okay? Um, most biological fluids have pH values in the range of six to eight, because that's extremely close to seven, which is neutral. Um, I advise you to, you'll probably do a pH lab where you test a bunch of different stuff. If you test different types of water, like bottled water, tap water, sink water from your uh, school sink or something, like just test some different waters and look at the different pHs. You'll notice that some pHs, like some of the water that tastes a little weird is usually very acidic because it contains some sort of salt or something, right? Like Dasani, there's all those conspiracy theories about Dasani. It's acidic and it says in the ingredients that it contains a particular salt. Kind of crazy. But do that for your own little experiment with some pH paper to kind of look at some of the water around you in your life. Here's a pH scale. What would you find in the middle? Seven, which is neutral, which is water, which means that our concentration of hydroxide and hydronium is equal. Okay. In acidic solutions, if you see here in the beaker, you have a whole bunch of these H pluses, right? Our hydronium is very high. Our hydrogen is very high. Okay, and then in our basic solutions, we have a lot of that hydroxide, that OH minus. Okay, so here's just some basic like household um, examples for you. These are the same pictures. Basic base is going to have a lot of OH. Neutral will have equal H and OH. And acidic will have a whole bunch of H plus. Okay, buffers. Buffers are really important. Um, the internal pH of most living systems has to be close to seven because that's neutral. You don't want acidic blood. You don't want very basic or alkaline blood. Okay, drinking too much of that alkaline water can actually change the pH of your blood over time and it's not great for you. It tastes better, I agree, but drinking too much of it can be bad for you. So everything in moderation, that's the moral of the story. Okay, so buffers are substances that minimize changes in concentrations, uh, changes in the concentration of a solution. So that means that it resists a change of pH. Okay, so most buffers consist of an acid-base pair that reversibly combines with H. Okay, so here's an example of carbonic acid. It's a buffer that contributes to pH stability in the human blood. Okay, so it says that here you've got your carbonic acid in response to a rise in pH, it goes in one direction, and in a response to the drop in pH, it goes in the opposite direction. So this helps to resist the change of pH 
a buffer resists the change in pH because it's kind of like it can act as either an acceptor or donor um, based on the different uh, direction that you read the equation in. Cool, we made it. So that was it for chapter two. Chapter three, we're gonna be talking about some uh, macromolecules and the importance of carbon. So we talked about the importance of water today. So still keep that in mind as we move forward to the importance of carbon. And y'all have a great day.